good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Sweezy Fogarty, and I'm a parent volunteer here at Pitzer and have been a member of the Family Leadership Council for the past two years. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., we actually have an open meeting of the Family Leadership Council, so we hope you will join us to learn more about how families help Pitzer thrive. But I'd like to get this session started by introducing our speaker, Professor Sarah Budishak. Professor Budishak is the Assistant Professor of Biology at Keck Science. She's been the, at the college since 2018. She received her PhD of Ecology, Biology, and Wildlife Disease from the University of Georgia and her Master of Wildlife Services from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Her recent courses include Disease Ecology and Evolution and Biology. So thank you all for joining us. These sessions are such an amazing look at the Pitzer College faculty and, and a really intimate opportunity to, to interact with, with this academic leadership. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Budishak and conversation of the session, the next pandemic, question <laughs> mark. So welcome. And you can take all it right. Away. Welcome. And it's so good to see you all. Um, I'm glad you could make it. And this is Pitzer. So we get to know each other. Um, so I would love for us to just go around and say hello, introduce yourself um, and say hi to everyone if you're able to. Uh, if Zoom is not your thing or you're not in a place where unmuting and muting works for you, that's fine, too. Um, but uh, I would love to just say hello and um, how you're connected to Pitzer. Um, so, uh, Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Delacatius. I'm a class of 2024 parent, and we're over here in the Boston area, and it's a little loud in my house, so I'm going to go back on mute. Uh, nice. Nice to meet you, Helen. We'll go next. Um, we're in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, our daughter's in class of 2021. And I graduated of Pitzer in 1982. Uh, nice. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm a parent of um, Esme, and she's a class of 2021. And we're our whole family is very sorry that we're not in Claremont now for family weekend. So it's very disappointing. We're here in uh, Portland, Oregon. Hi, I'll unmute for a second here. Um, I'm Danielle and I have a graduate from Pitzer um, from just this last May and a current student as well at Pitzer, a junior. Hi, I'm Carolyn Richter. I'm outside of Washington, DC. And I too have a student and graduated Clayton from Pitzer a few years ago, and a current student, Hunter, who will be graduating uh, next year. My name is Jeff Hewitt, and I have a daughter, Sarah, who's a first year, and uh, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. Delighted to be here. Uh, hello, my name is Christian, I'm sorry, my camera's not working, uh, class of 2025. Uh, new here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Hi, I'm Amanda and I'm uh, actually I'm part of the alumni and family engagement team. I'm Brooke. I'm also part of the alumni and family engagement team. All right, well, I am so Hi, glad I'm you Lily. all are here. Oh, and Lily's microphone works now, yay. <laughs> yes, I figured it out. Sorry about that. I'm Lily, I'm also part of the alumni and family engagement team. I'm really excited for this session. Thank you, Sarah. I feel like I'm going to be part, like that lawyer with who's not a cat in that every time I get on Zoom, my cat knows I'm on Zoom and she comes to be with me. So you will be seeing my cat periodically. 
All right, um, so it's so wonderful that you're all here. Um, so I study the ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. Um, so it really just means I take this kind of big picture view on infectious diseases um, and where do they come from? How do they work the way they do? Um, a lot of my research focuses on how do different diseases interact with each other? So what happens when um, individuals have to fight off two different kinds of um, disease threats at the same time. Um, and I involve a lot of students in that sort of research. I'm really excited for when students can be back on campus and do research with me in person. And this semester, I am teaching a class called the Biology of Infectious Diseases. And this is a class, a new class for non-majors where we think about infectious diseases from scales all the way down from like the molecules all the way up to big picture evolutionary questions about infectious diseases. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. And I want you to feel free to call out, um, ask questions. Um, I have some slides and uh, to talk with you about, uh, but feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, so one of the questions a lot of people in my field think about is what is gonna be the next pandemic? And before we can talk about that, we need to get on the same page about a little bit of terminology, and I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Um, but the first one is um, we need to talk about what an endemic disease is versus an epidemic. An endemic is a disease that's just constantly present. Um, it can fluctuate a little bit, but it's in an area at a kind of general level over time. Where an epidemic is when you have a sudden increase in new cases of an infectious disease. And that brings us to pandemic, which is just a large scale epidemic. Um, often involves multiple continents, but it doesn't really have a formal definition other than it's just a really big epidemic. So how do epidemics start? Um, we talk about this um, using the term disease emergence. These diseases have to come from where something has to change. Why are they becoming so much more common? at any given time point. So we refer to this phenomena as disease emergence. And diseases can emerge for, um, in different ways. One way is they can expand in geographic range. This means they get to new areas. Um, and in these new areas, they can find new individuals to infect um, and increase in caseload that way. One example of this is Zika virus. Um, Zika virus, had an epidemic um, kind of the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, and it did it by spreading to a new geographic area. Um, Zika is a mosquito-borne virus, um, and uh, it was really difficult to control this outbreak because only about one in five people became sick with it, so it was hard to know who had it. Um, it was usually mild, and we didn't have any treatments or vaccines for it. Um, and what this looks like on a map is Zika has been around for a long time. It was first reported, oops, let me get my uh, laser pointer out here. It was first reported um, in Central Africa in 1947, um, but it didn't spread very far, very fast. Um, but in 2015, it made it to a new geographic area, um, South and Central America. And this is when we saw a huge spike in cases. Um, so this is what an epidemic looks like. Like my little cartoon said, you get a big spike in cases and then it decreases over time um, as people become immune, as we find ways to um, fight it using public health measures. Um, so this is an example of one that had this epidemic because it got to a new area, it found a whole bunch of new hosts that were susceptible. The second way diseases can be classified as emerging is that they increase in what we call virulence, which is how much um, harm or sickness or um, higher mortality rate. And uh, this can happen too often. Um, this happens when we have an infectious diseases that already spread between humans. And um, we generally have some sort of treatment, whether it's a vaccine or drugs, um, but this virus or bacteria can mutate and then it can um, evade these treatments we have and therefore become more virulent. 
Um, it can also just have some sort of mutation uh, that makes it increase in virulence. Um, and an example of this one is what we call the reemergence, because this is a disease that's been around, but it's, it's coming back again, is with tuberculosis. And this is a map showing what percentage of patients have drug-resistant tuberculosis. So this is tuberculosis that has evolved resistance to the antibiotics we use to treat it. Um, so these individuals are much harder to treat. They get very sick. They can be more likely to spread it. So this is a disease that is re-emerging because the bacteria are evolving resistance. And then these resistant strains are the ones that are getting transmitted. All right, the third way that diseases can emerge is what we call host range, um, increasing in host range. Well, this really just means they're jumping between host species. So it could be a virus that infected a monkey that is now infecting humans or a bacteria that was in a bat that now infects humans. And this is a really important um, one to be focusing on. Um, so it can happen in a couple different ways. Oftentimes, we have some sort of domestic animal, like livestock or um, dogs or cats, that humans have a lot of contact with. And just unluckily, some sort of virus or bacteria from this animal jumps to humans. Well, how does that wildlife animal get, or how does that domestic animal get sick? Well, oftentimes, it can pick up um, a new infection from some sort of wildlife species. So we have it going from a wildlife species to a domestic animal to humans. And only occasionally, but it happens, whatever this um, virus or bacteria is that jumped to humans is also able to spread from human to human. So this is another barrier that these diseases have to overcome is not just infect a human, but be able to transmit to another human and do that readily enough that it can spread. And then humans travel, humans move. Um, so once a disease is able to spread from human to human, um, it's very hard to contain these infections and they can spread widely. Um, and about 75% of these emerging infectious diseases are coming, are starting from non-human animals. So those other routes are about 25% and this route is about 75% of the emerging infectious diseases. Um, so what kinds of animals have the potential to spread diseases to humans? Um, the term that we use for these diseases that can jump from a non-human animal to a human is a zoonotic disease. Um, so often they're the ones with lots of human contact. They just have more probability. We, we touch these animals a lot more. We breathe in um, uh, their respiratory um, particles more. Uh, they can also be species that are closely related to humans. Uh, bacteria and viruses need particular environments and cues and proteins on the outside of cells to get into um, the host. And when um, animals are more closely related to humans, um, some of those steps are easier for these bacteria and viruses. Um, and another trait is um, animals that have lots of jumpy infections, so infections that are likely to spread into new hosts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is what this sort of research looks like in my field. Um, this was a study done by a group of scientists and uh, this was published in 2017. And they were really interested in what kinds of animals have viruses that may um, spread to humans. And they looked at this uh, you can just look at these different pictures, lots of different kinds of mammals. And this chart on the left looks at what proportion of the viruses that we know about in these animals are zoonotic. So that means they can actually spread from animals to humans. And some of these are really high, but they're also just not very well studied species. We don't, there's not many dots here, which means we probably only know the ones that come to humans and we don't know any ones they have um, just by themselves. Um, but for the well-studied ones, you can see um, that there are some species like bats and primates and mice that have a lot more viruses that jump to humans. Uh, you might be wondering what these little red dots are, these kind of maroonish red. These, um, the 
all the dark red spots are domesticated animals. So a lot of these ones that have viruses that jump to humans are domestic species. So um, a lot of them are down in this one here, this hooved animal, so this is where you see cows and pigs. And we just know a lot more of their viruses. These are animals we study. You see um, these well-studied ones are often these domestic species. Um, but it's not just domestic species that have viruses that um, can spread to humans. Um, a lot of people are doing research trying to figure out, so where is spillover happening? What kinds of species is it coming from? This is another study where they looked at how, what is the diversity of species within these animal groups and uh, the number of zoonotic uh, uh, animals that have zoonotic viruses or bacteria. And what they found was th the more species there are in a group, the more species they have that spill over to humans. Um, and you can, uh, this map here is showing um, where the spillover, where this transmission from wildlife to humans is happening and where it's happening for different kinds of species. So this top one here is for bats and you see there's a lot, um, these darker purple colors show more transmission. So there's a lot of bat transmission happening in South and Central America and Southeastern Asia. Whereas rodents are the primary um, cause uh, or primary source of these viruses jumping to humans in North America and Europe. And in um, Africa, uh, it's a lot of these hooved mammals um, that are carrying these viruses that jump to humans. What's really important in this research is they're also figuring out where do we have holes in this knowledge? Where are we missing a lot of information? Um, a lot of times, the more what the data will show is, well, the more we study it, the more transmissions we see. And what we really need to be is uh, better at is studying where these are happening um, or potentially happening all across the globe so we can have better informed answers. And it's not just, well, we know where we're studying it and we don't know where we're not studying it. Um, so this is a map showing where we're likely missing a lot of these um, viral zoonoses, these viruses jumping from wildlife to humans. Where is it probably happening, but we're not studying it? Um, so this shows where we need to put in more research effort um, to understand these. Um, so this one here in A, um, so red means we're missing a lot of these and green means we're not missing any. And overall, it's, it's a lot of, um, a large area of South America is where we're probably missing most of these. They're going undetected. They're happening, but we just don't know about it. And you can look at this, these maps by these different kinds of host species to see what kind of species do we need to be studying where to understand um, the viruses that are making this jump into humans. All right. And I just wanted to highlight bats in particular uh, bats have a lot of viruses. They have a lot of viruses that can jump to humans. Uh, but what's really notable about bats is they have a lot of viruses that are really deadly when they jump to humans. And uh, often these viruses, we've been, um, a lot of the most recent um, emerging infectious diseases have bats as the original host of the virus. And they're often very deadly. Um, so um, this is a schematic just showing um, three of, well, kind of two of the most more recent um, emergence events happening from bats. And in all of these cases, the bats transmit or spread the virus to some sort of domestic animal, and then it spreads to humans. So in the case of Hendra virus, um, bats, um, these were bats that like to eat fruit. There was a fruit tree in the middle of a pasture. The horses like to um, eat the grass under that tree. They got the virus and they spread it to um, the horse trainers and then it spread out from there. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's bats spreading it to pigs. Pigs may be spreading it to other pigs then spreading it to humans, uh, but it can also spread directly from bats to humans. Um, so with this one Nipah virus, different outbreaks had different ca causes. They all started in bats, 
Um, but sometimes it got spread to horses, sometimes to pigs, sometimes directly to humans. Um, and these bat-borne viruses tend to be really deadly um, when they infect humans. You can see these are really high mortality rates. Bats also seem uh, to be the host for the current uh, pandemic virus. Um, so this is what we call a phylogeny. You can think of it as a family tree for a virus. Um, so we have these connections. Um, it branches when you get uh, uh, kind of the child, the, what we call the child viruses of um, the, uh, the original ones. And you can see how these um, lineages of viruses evolve over time. So let's look back at this. So in this one over here is like the most ancient virus parent. And coming down these, you see different branches of the family tree of this virus. And what is notable is that samples that were taken from bats are shown in blue. So all of these samples here were taken from bats. These ones here, these ones here. And this cluster here at the top are all samples taken during the SARS coronavirus um, epidemic uh, that happened in 2013 and into 2014. Um, this epidemic spread through 26 countries and resulted in more than 8,000 cases. Um, it, this virus was not as good at spreading from person to person as the current one. Um, it was also a lot more deadly, um, but it was easier to contain because we, there were not as many individuals who had it and didn't show symptoms. Um, so uh, they were able to contain it. And uh, we haven't seen any cases of it since 2004. Um, so this is one that's probably been eradicated. Down here on this branch of the family tree, um, all these red samples are samples that are taken during the current pandemic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see it's kind of a, a, a distant cousin of that previous one. Um, the closest relatives that we know about um, to this virus that was detected in humans um, or in a bat. Um, but in both of these, I want you to notice that th there's a, a pretty good sized branch here and here. We don't know exactly how it got from a bat into a person. Uh, it could have got, been right from a bat to a person. It could have gone through some other animal, um, an animal market. Um, civic cats were suspected for a while at first in the first pandemic to be, for it have gone from bat to civic cat to human. But if you look close in at the phylogeny, whatever infected the humans also infected the civic cats. Uh, they're kind of more downstream on the family tree. So they, they couldn't have been the original cause of this virus. Um, so again, it's really likely that bats um, we're the host, maybe not exactly directly, but they're the ones that maintain this virus. They're um, where these vi viruses are found and kind of the source material for these viruses that are jumping to humans. All right, and um, so we now know how diseases emerge. They can increase in range, in virulence, they can jump hosts. Often this host jumping is done through some sort of intermediary, like a, a pet or a farm animal. It's also really important to note that these emerging infectious diseases are increasing, both in frequency and in magnitude. So this is a graph. Um, this axis here is showing time. So it starts in 1960, goes up to 2020. And um, this study was done in uh, China and they looked at how many provinces were affected by these different outbreaks. And you see is over time, not only are there more dots, these dots have some really large ones. Large ones are the total number of cases. And they start moving up higher on this graph, which means that they're spreading more geographically. They're getting to more places. And this is just an area where they've studied this really well. We could do this for pretty much any area of the world and we'd see the same sort of pattern. So why are these emerging infectious diseases increasing? Well, a big contributor are human activities. Um, things like the increased density of humans, 
makes it easier for infectious diseases to spread. Um, at the same time, we're increasing the density of livestock and of domestic animals um, that can all increase, even though these are rare events, the more times you roll that dice, the um, higher, um, overall, you're gonna get a higher chance of this rare event happening. There's also been increased movement on the planet, not just of humans, but also of livestock and domestic animals. So this is more opportunities to spread pathogens. Uh, another big source, big potential source of these um, emerging infectious diseases are things like animal markets and the wildlife trade. Um, both of these SARS epidemics have been traced back to animal markets. Um, another factor that is increasing this risk is global climate change. Uh, this is increasing the suitability of lots of places for vectors. So vectors are typically insects um, that can carry and spread infectious diseases. So you can think about um, malaria, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. As more places warm up, they, there's more suitable habitat for mosquitoes. And um, if an, a mosquito-borne disease gets there, they have more chance to spread. Um, also, in some places, if as it's warming during the winter, there's less die-off of mosquitoes and these diseases can persist for longer. Um, a lot of other changes that humans are, um, are doing to, that uh, affect these wild systems are increasing risk of emerging infectious diseases. Things like urbanization and deforestation can put uh, different combinations of animals together. Uh, they can put humans and livestock much, much closer to a bunch of wildlife, um, increasing that risk of spread. And then the last one, which is also worth mentioning, is overuse of antibiotics. So um, the more antibiotics are used, the more chances bacteria have of evolving resistance to them. And a lot of the antibiotics we used to use to treat infections are no longer working because of this evolution of resistance. And it's really becoming problematic uh, where we're losing um, uh, antibiotics that used to be effective against diseases and no longer are. And the pipeline for developing new antibiotics is um, very slow and there's just not much financial incentive to it. Um, so we're, we're using up antibiotics and not finding any new ones. All right. Any questions so far? So, Sarah, I'm I'm curious. The uh, what, when we look at all of the things we're doing to increase the likelihood mm -hmm. of these outbreaks, um, I, I know that in China, for example, they've I think they've passed laws to um, uh, relative to their wet markets to try and reduce transmission. Mm -hmm. But are there other things that governments are are currently doing or not doing that you think would be helpful to preventing, you know, another pandemic? Yeah, so I think um, investing in surveillance, um, investing in um, public health, just basic public health things like how many masks do countries have on the standby? Um, how easy is it for physicians in rural areas to report strange infectious diseases? and take the proper samples and actually get them sequenced to see what is um, causing uh, the symptoms that they see in patients and is it a new pathogen that we need to worry about. Um, these kind of early detection systems I think are really important. Um, and uh, at, there's, um, at least early in the pandemic, um, one of the countries that had the most like PPE, personal protective, equipment and stuff stockpiled uh, was Finland and they were able to keep cases there low, much lower than all their neighboring countries for a long time because they just had things at the ready. Um, the faster that we can detect and slow uh, the rate of transmission and spread of these infections, the better we're gonna be able to do. Uh, not only does it minimize how many people get sick, 
but it also gives these viruses and bacteria less um, rolls of the dice to mutate and evade our um, tools that we're using to uh, treat them. So if we can treat it sooner, they're less likely to evolve resistance. Um, we're seeing all these new strains of coronavirus right now. Um, and if it's not surprising that we're seeing mutations because it's getting so many chances to mutate every time it's transmitted. So because so many people have it, it's gotten to roll this dice where these mutations that might help it are gonna be really rare. But if you roll the dice a million times, yeah, they're gonna pick up some mutations that are really helpful. Um, so I think those are things that are gonna be really important. I think another big one um, that is outside my area of expertise, but I'm hoping that, um, like this is why I'm, I'm really excited about teaching a non-majors course that people who are interested in things like economics are taking my class and uh, government and politics because when countries, we want countries to report this, we want there to be reporting, we want to know what's happening we want to be able to mobilize global resources um, to help um, minimize these threats before they come, become bigger threats. But it's also um, the sort of economic disincentives to say when your country might have an emerging infectious disease, borders get closed, trade stops, people's livelihoods, um, economies are all damaged. Um, so I think we need to work on a way uh, to do that and to be able to have honesty and uh, be able to aid and fix these problems that really are global problems um, without making it one country's problem. Um, one thing that has been done or tried to do um, is to stop naming infectious diseases after the place where they're first detected. Um, like let's not blame it on the place where this first happened. Um, and that's why COVID-19 has such a boring name. It's a coronavirus that was detected in 2019. Um, but you'll, you can go back and look at publications that are calling it Wuhan virus. That's, not, that's the kind of thing that isn't helpful um, in really showing that these are shared problems. Yeah, um, one of the biggest things you can do as an individual um, is to eat less meat. Um, and this might seem like a strange one, um, but uh, when we have, let me get this off of here. Um, sorry, when I have a laser pointer, all, it's hard for All me to kinds see. of meat, Sarah? I mean, how? Or just um, less so, cow? Yeah, so a lot of the spillover happens with domestic animal intermediaries. So when we can have fewer domestic animals, less chance of it happening. Um, if you can uh, buy meat that has been raised sustainably that you know wasn't in a high um, density environment, that's also contributes to promoting those sorts of um, agricultural methods. Uh, so actually also hunting, lot, hunting is yeah. much better for this, right? Because you're taking oh, yes. game in the wild mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. It is um, depending on where you are and what kind of game you're hunting. Um, for the sorts of game we'd hunt in North America, that's true. Um, yeah. But hunting game in other parts of the world, um, if you're hunting a species that has a lot of viruses that can jump to humans, um, that is uh, going to increase disease risk. So a lot of Ebola um, disease risk comes from people hunting um, primates and uh, they are the carriers of Ebola um, and it can um, spread, well, it often resides in bats, primates. gets into primates and then um, people eating primates is how- oh, um, Like hunting get monkeys and apes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not common in, the, in North America, but certainly yeah. in Africa, I hadn't realized they did that in Africa, okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that increases Ebola risk, interesting, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing is not eating meat that has been raised with antibiotics. Um, a lot of this antibiotic use, um, I guess antibiotics are used more on livestock than they are by humans. Right. Um, so reducing right. that can reduce the risk of um, antibiotic resistance. 
Yeah. And probably the other countermeasure there, right, is putting in financial incentives for um, academic and pharmaceutical funded research into new forms of antibiotics, right, to treat disease. Yes, um, definitely. So we need new antibiotics. We need to be wiser with how we use the ones that we currently have. Exactly. Yeah. So interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I can show you a map. This is a dated map. Um, it hasn't been updated. This is a map from 1940, 2004, um, that has, a, uh, it's an old map, so I'm sorry that the, <laughs> the resolution's not great on it. Um, but this shows about 500 locations where specific diseases emerged. And the red ones are just where there were multiple emergence events. And when I first saw this, I was a little surprised because a lot of them are happening in um, North America, in Europe. Um, and this is because a lot of these are due um, to things like foodborne infections, um, drug resistant um, microbes, uh, bacteria and viruses. Um, and also this is, these are the areas where we have a lot of agricultural practices of having animals in um, dense uh, and pens and pastures. Um, and also where there's a lot more international travel. It's also where there's a lot more tools to detect these things. Um, so again, this goes back to, we find them where we look, um, they're happening everywhere. And um, we really need more surveillance overall and we can target it. We can use what we know to target what kind of species we need to study in different places to help us predict and understand um, when these events are happening, how they're happening, how to treat them, how to study them, like how to sequence them, how to have cell lines ready to study them and culture them, um, start thinking about vaccines for the ones that we see jumping a lot. Um, this is another map. Um, people are, are really interested in predicting where these diseases are gonna emerge. Um, this was um, a study that looked at uh, sort of where globally the most risk of the emerging infectious diseases are. are. Um, and this one factored in these land use changes um, so things like um, deforestation, and that brings agriculture even closer to wildlife. Um, so that's why that is a really big risk threat. Um, so when we found out that this next pandemic was a bat-borne virus that emerged in um, Western China, that was not really a surprise to people in this field. Like this, we were, we had, um, the sequence from this virus so quickly because there's a lab there that's studying these infections and could sequence it and detect it really quickly um, because we know that this is a hot spot where these things can happen. Um, and we can even think about the study like the factors that lead to this. Um, one of the big contributing factors are areas that still have intact biodiversity and also humans nearby. Um, so things like having um, a lot of mammal biodiversity and a lot of trees. Uh, so think about the Amazon, think about these areas in Southeast Asia where um, there's um, a lot of intact habitat, but also a lot of people um, nearby. That's where we're getting um, these, that's where we're seeing more of these events. Um, Would the trees I, contribute to animal density? Yeah, so um, you could think of it as just like a proxy for intact habitats. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, and then I wanted to just talk a bit more specifically about coronaviruses. And um, because we talked about the first SARS epidemic, um, the current one, um, these viruses are ones that often jump between host species. So I also mentioned that these pathogens that are jumpy, that, could, that know how to infect different species or um, if they get the chance can sometimes infect other species. And this is another one of those phylogenetic trees. Um, but what I want you to look at is that there's a lot of different species here that have had coronaviruses. Um, so they're found most often in bats. We think bats are the ones that um, kind of 
where they stay most of the time, but they can jump to other species like minks and ferrets and humans. And um, murine is a mouse, um, camels, rats, different kinds of bats, hedgehogs, civets. And there have been many times where these viruses have been, de been detected in humans where they haven't caused epidemics. Um, there's lots of cases where we know where a human has antibodies, um, which are this immune memory to these kinds of coronaviruses, but no one else that they've interacted with does. They just, this one individual got exposed to a virus, that's where it ended, no ongoing transmission. And that's what probably happens most of the time. Um, it's, this virus would already have to have the mutations in place to spread from human to human and also be the one that accidentally got sneezed from a pig onto a human. Those are rare events, uh, but the more chances we get it for it to happen, the more likely it is. Um, so uh, I just wanted to note that this branch right here is the MERS virus. Um, this is a virus um, that emerged in 2007, 2008, and um, we still see cases of it from time to time. And it typically spreads from a bat to a camel or other animal and then to a human. And there's been very, very little uh, transmission directly from human to human. It has happened, it can happen, um, but it's one that just kind of seems to be able to make the jump to humans, but not jump from human to human. Um, my animations are a bit out of order, sorry. Um, this one right here is that 2013, 2003 pandemic. Um, for the first SARS coronavirus. And it was able to spread to human to human, um, but not in the way that this current one is. Um, so where there's a lot more human to human transmission happening um, with this current coronavirus. And it's just really a roll of the dice, which virus kind of gets into human populations and then what happens from there. And the longer it's in human populations, the more natural selection can act on it and it can, if it um, gets the right mutations, it can improve its transmission to be able to transmit better and better. We have seen these waves of change of what are the most dominant virus strains as one gets a mutation that allows it to transmit better and better. It becomes the dominant type. Um, and we've seen this process happening through the current pandemic. Um, and what's really worrying now is some of these new ones um, might not be as well defended against by the vaccines. So, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's it okay if I jump in with another question? Yeah. Um, and for the other attendees, just tell me to pipe down if I'm hogging the questions. So it's, uh, I'll pipe down. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, not to minimize H1N1 or MERS or any of the other, uh, the other you know, pandemics, but th those didn't kill anywhere near the number of people, right? You know, so not to say they weren't a big deal, but the impact dramatically less, right? So, mm -hmm. how um, how do we know when it's going to be something really serious like COVID nineteen? And like, did we know? Did you know? Were you looking at this early? I mean, I, like, how do we yeah, know? Okay, well, we need to really buckle down. Versus, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it'll magically disappear. You know, and this one didn't magically disappear, at least mm -hmm. not yet. So, um, I. So yes, um, the week before Pitzer closed down, on that Monday, I prepared my lecture for Wednesday on coronaviruses and taught my students all this and told them we probably would not be back. And I was the only one who did that. And they were like very shocked on Friday. Or I, guess, um, I told them that on Monday, on Wednesday, they announced it. Um, and they were like, they were very shocked. And they're like, really, you don't think we'll be back? Okay. And I was like, <sighs> Uh, this, the, there's a lot of reasons why I think this one is, was going to be a big one and has turned out to be a big one. Um, one of the biggest factors, which is a really good thing, um, but also a reason that has enabled it to spread, is that it has a much lower mortality rate. People do not get as sick with this virus. Um, MERS, I think, has a mortality rate of about 70%, I think it was about 25% for the first SARS coronavirus, but I haven't looked at those numbers recently. And this one is like 5% um, 
when it was first noticed, it's down closer to, is it like one to 2% most places now? Um, and uh, there's this principle that I've been teaching for years in my class about this trade-off between transmission and virulence. And diseases um, that are really virulent that cause a lot of damage to their hosts those hosts may be less able to have fewer contacts or less able to transmit it. Um, and what is, so a lot of infections um, have ways to get around that. Um, individuals can be infectious before they show symptoms. That allows them to spread before the host is actually like showing these sickness symptoms and probably has reduced contacts. Um, the other thing um, that can help them with that is if, some individuals don't show these disease symptoms. And that allows those individuals to have lots of contacts and yet still be infectious. And this uh, virus can do that. This virus, not everybody shows symptoms. So when we go to impose public health measures, we don't even know who's sick. And you can't just tell people to stay home when you're sick um, because they don't even know they're sick. Um, so that's why this one has been so successful is because there's all this secret transmission happening. Um, and I guess I was really concerned when um, I kind of, I didn't hear it through, I heard it through like Twitter um, that there were places that these um, regular flu surveillance tests happening in Washington and places were detecting cases in the community back when we were only thinking that it was travelers who needed to isolate and be quarantined. Because once it got in and into communities, um, it was gonna be really hard to stop because you don't know who's infected. Um, so I think that is a big factor that has made this one um, be able to spread and last as long as it has. Um, whereas the first SARS coronavirus, like when someone dies of a mysterious illness, it gets investigated. Um, but when someone's just a little bit sick, those are the ones that can spread um, more widely spread faster. Um, a lot of the times this virus moved at big geographic regions, it was people who didn't know they were sick. They were asymptomatic. Yeah. How long do you think it'll be before we, we have another bad one like this one? Uh, so um, we can kind of look. Um, this one, SARS, the first SARS was in 2003, MERS was in 2007, this one's 2019. Um, it's just a matter of time till another one spills over that can transmit human to human. Um, but I think this one has been big enough that hopefully for a while there will be more investment in early detection, early surveillance, in having um, public, in public health systems and things like notifying and how to detect and notify and um, impose isolations and quarantine, people may be more likely to follow those sort of rules even if they don't feel sick um, to prevent the next one of these. Um, so, I mean, these are low probability events, um, but we're giving them enough chances. Um, so it's going to happen, but it's really difficult to predict how long it's going to be until the next one. Um, yeah, and I guess what we really need to <laughs> hope is that uh, like the next one also has a low mortality rate um, or we can just detect it and get in there faster. Um, one of the things that I think has been really helpful for the next pandemic is how quickly we were able to develop um, these uh, RNA-based vaccines uh, because they're really easy to switch out what kind of pathogen they're defending against. Um, so I think that is gonna be a really helpful tool um, if this happens again, when this happens again. But as to when it's gonna happen, I, I <laughs> no one can say. Can I ask uh, a question? Mm -hmm. um, regarding the I just am not hearing a lot anymore about this. We're being told double masking, um, which we, I'm in California, we're all about masks. Um, but what happened to the discussion about our eyes 
And is that, how are we protecting and is that the continuation why we won't be able to get a grip on this? I'm not hearing anybody talk about it going in my eyes anymore, which are not protected by my double mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I don't know much about that. Um, I think a lot of the concern about eyes was when we were more concerned about surface transmission. So the virus particles getting on your fingers and then people touching their eyes. Um, I, um, but yeah, I don't know if um, how easy a route that would be for the virus to get in. Um, this virus, the receptors that it uses to get into cells are ones that are the respiratory tract. Um, so when we breathe things up our nose or our mouth, they can get to those cells that have the right kind of lock and key system for the virus to get in there easier. Um, and why our eyes are connected um, kind of through our sinuses to that system, it's a much less direct connection. Um, and a lot of the secretions that we have in our eyes and our tears um, have antimicrobial properties. Um, so that can help. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a much bigger risk when we get our when the virus has a chance to get in in good enough numbers um, to these respiratory tract cells. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I flew on a plane and I wore a face mask, um, a, a face shield. Um, it's not going to prevent the kind of airflow getting into your eyes, but it will help you keep from touching your eyes. Um, and it's really good at preventing splatters. Um, I think that's another time where we worry about eyes as a transmission route when people are doing like medical procedures where respiratory secretions could actually splash into eyes. Um, I don't think it's, there's a lot of risk just from like airborne transmission into eyes, but I also haven't read any studies on that. So I would want to um, give a definitive answer. Yeah, great questions. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for presenting today. I think we've got to actually get kicked off this link soon to start our next sessions, mm -hmm. but this was such a fascinating topic. Um, and I'm sure there was probably a lot more questions. So um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to um, email engagement. We can forward them to Sarah, if you're willing to take these questions. Still. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. It was nice to meet you. Bye. Thank Sarah. you very much. Bye.